I'm Derek Bruff. I'm the director of the Vanderbilt Center for Teaching, and I'm glad to see so many smiling faces. Let's see. Holly is here, and Shaul is here, um, and Kate is here. So we have all three of our panelists. That's a good start. And lots more people. Some names I know, some names I don't. I um, Historically, at the Center for Teaching, I would never attempt to organize a workshop or panel the week before Thanksgiving break, because no one would come. But this is not a typical year, so I was very excited to see all the interest in today's topic. But I will let people know or remind folks that, you know, last year we um, we had a, a full day symposium called Learning to Play on the use of uh, games and simulations for teaching, or in some cases teaching about games and simulations. Um, Derek Price and Helen Shin helped to organize that with me last year. Um, we had great support from the Curb Center, the Center for Teaching, the Senator, Center for Digital Humanities and the CMAP program. Um, that was a really great day. Um, definitely the highlight of my, one of the highlights of my year last year. Um, it wasn't possible to get a bunch of us in the same room together again this fall and throw beanbags and such as we did last year. Um, but I wanted to circle back to this topic of learning at play in some capacity. Um, and um, as I was just observing all the different ways that faculty and grad students and other instructors responded to the pandemic and to the new teaching context that we find ourselves in. Um, I kept hearing of some really interesting stories of folks using games and simulations um, at, uh, as a way to teach during the current situation. And so um, I reached out to a few of those folks, uh, Holly and Shoal and Kate, and asked them if they might be willing to share their experiences um, with the crowd. And we're up to 38 participants, that's super exciting again. Um, not typical turnout for a CFT event in mid-November, but um, I'm very excited to have you all with us here today. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, here's how this is gonna work. I'm gonna say a few words about our panelists here, um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to them to share a bit. I've asked each, each of them to talk for seven or 10 minutes about the ways that they've been using games and simulations in their teaching uh, this year. Um, that should take us to about the halfway point of our, our time together. And then um, I'm going to invite you all to ask questions and um, share ideas, um, maybe some things that you've done with games and simulations in your teaching or ideas that you're, you're experimenting with. I'd love to hear. We've got quite a crowd here. Um, I, will, um, I will play the role. Hold on. Um, um, I will play the role of uh, voice of the chat today, uh, given this size. Hold on. I have a, I have a thing. I'm the voice of the chat. So um, uh, if you have questions or comments as we go along, if you'll put them in the chat, that'll be the best place to go given the numbers that we have here. If we had a smaller crowd, we might we might do it another way, but um, I'd love um, for you guys to share resources or questions or ideas in the chat as we go. I'll be monitoring that and I will take some time after the initial presentations to kind of share some questions with our panelists. Um, and then we'll go from there. We may we may have some folks share out via audio or video as well as we go, but um, fairly informal, but hopefully um, you'll get some ideas today for um, ways that you might use games or simulations in your teaching, um, the kinds of uh, learning objectives or teaching goals that they might help you meet. Um, and also some ideas for kind of adapting to our current uh, situation, whether that's um, teaching about the pandemic, as some of our panelists are doing, um, or just teaching in new and unfamiliar contexts in remote and online instruction. So, um, so our panelists today uh, are three. We have uh, Holly Tucker, who is Mellon Foundation Chair. Holly, glad to have you with us here today. Uh, Michelle Kellner, who is an associate professor of psychology and Jewish studies, uh, sharing with us as well. And uh, Kirby, a PhD in biological sciences and um, occupier of at least a couple of different roles at the Center for Teaching over the past few years, um, working with other grad students and their teams. So we're happy to have you as well. 
Um, so with that, I think I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to our very creative um, and entertaining panelists. Um, we'll start with you, Holly, if you wouldn't mind going first and telling us about how you've been teaching with games and simulations this fall. Well, thanks, Derek. Hi, everybody. Um, Derek, I'm hoping it's coming from your side. I've got a little bit of a lag. Um, um, I'm on campus for the first time in a long time at the Humanities Center, so it's very nice to be home um, in the Vaughn home. Um, so I am teaching this semester uh, a course, RPW, Robert Penn Warren, 3333W, Rethinking Pandemics um, from an, a Cultural History from Antiquity to Now. Um, this is not a course that I've taught before, although I have taught as, as someone who works in the history of medicine, I have taught the history of pandemics, and the, but I've certainly never taught about the history of pandemics while uh, my students and I and the rest of the world are experiencing pandemics. Um, the beginning of the course, um, it was all um, uh, online, mostly asynchronous online, um, thanks to the OCW, uh, OCDI this summer, the amazing work of the Center for Teaching. Um, I, I modeled a lot of what I've been doing um, on their uh, great advice, even using the same icons for the activities. Um, and what I found is uh, students were very engaged, um, but I was missing that spontaneous synchronous aspect. Um, for the most part, I have to be off campus because of, of family concerns, so I couldn't teach in person. I had in the past, and if I'm going to share a screen with you, just so you can take a look. In the past, I've, um, I've done a couple of games through a consortium out of Barnard called Reacting to the Past, and it's largely a consortium of, of faculty members in history who have um, put together very um, strictly curated uh, role-playing games. Um, if we wanted to take a look at some of the games that they offer. Um, a wide variety. I've, I have done uh, the Rousseau Burke and the Revolution. So I've done the French Revolution. I've also done the, there's a game on Galileo. Um, the trial of Galileo. You can see the wide ranging. Um, there's the trial of Galileo. The various games that that are offered, that are they're published after they've been strictly vetted by the consortium um, through Norton. There are any number of games under review as well. Um, there are a variety of levels, um, and traditionally, typically these games are a lot of fun in which students take. They have um, detailed role sheets. Typically, they're part of a faction, and each of the role sheets are very different because the characters are different, and it gives each each character has um, their own personal objectives depending on what their um, their specific role is. So, in the case of Louis the Sixteenth in the French Revolution game, you might imagine that his main objective is to stay alive, right, and to figure out ways ways to do that. Um, as, as well, there are, um, each character has to give a speech and also has to write a paper. What I've done in the hall and in the, in the halls and classrooms of Furman Hall, I've done this, um, in person. And it's always, once the students, once the students warm up to it, it gets really heated. So in the French revolution game, the, um, the, uh, crowds led by some crowd leaders, um, we're trying to get their voices heard in the newly formed um, National Assembly. Just like Dungeons and Dragons, depending on what types of strength points or uh, other things that they've put together, they can have a greater chance through a die roll. So one of the ways of, of enhancing the die roll was to be able to do a petition. And I had students present from the crowds, present this was a year and a half ago or so, present a petition signed by 200 Vanderbilt students <laughs> to let the, the crowd's voice be heard. And in the Galileo game, um, they needed to do some sort of creative, that, uh, creative project um, um, that would, uh, that would voice their position on, on Galo, Galen's, um, 
um, theories and I had students singing me Galileo Galileo and they actually took the lyrics of the Queen song and, and performed it. Unfortunately, it was very early in the game and they hadn't paid really attention to what they were saying. So uh, the, the church faction took the, the lyrics of their rewritten game and then some of them were excommunicated from the church because they just weren't paying attention to the primary documents. So what I really, I'd heard about a game in development, it's in level two development. Um, you can see there are oh, tons of different games. It was called Death Comes to Norwich 1349. And this game was so very interesting because the conceit of the game was that the plague is coming to the, to the, to the town of Norwich in the second wave um, of the bubonic plague and the city uh, city leaders need to decide whether they will on three points. It's it's what they call a flashpoint game. So it's it's done over four um, four class periods. Where the Galileo and the French Revolution game is done over twelve to thirteen periods. They needed to make a decision about whether they would shut the city gates. And the second one was um, a plague was understood to be caused by bad air miasma. Inside the city, there were all different types of tradesmen doing um, work in, uh, you know, but the butchers, the tallow makers, what they were going to be doing with the trades, would they be um, taken out of the city? And then on top of it, flagellants, um, so the, the whipping of oneself, um, which was a fringe of the medieval church uh, in the, um, to be able to ask for God's forgiveness for sins and be able to lift the plague. And the Catholic church was not in favor of that because it seemed like a, an extremist group. The other question is, will the city allow there to be a flagellant procession? Now, what's interesting here is that, you know, to make a decision to get rid of the tradesmen, they they also have to, the trades faction, right? Clearly doesn't want that to happen. So they are doing everything to break or broker deals and to, and to create alliances so that the vote that will go their way. So let me just give you a sense of, of what I did is I did it um, a mix of asynchronous through Slack and then synchronous um, through Zoom. And we met three or four times, we met an initial organization, an organizational game, and then we met three times synchronously. So the parish, this is the Slack setup. So we have the parish records um, and it, we it, people die. So there's a grim leap, reaper lottery. Then as well, um, we have to keep track, right? Of who dies and who doesn't. So this gives you an idea of this would be the second vote. This was um, eventually proposed, negotiated in small rooms. So this is what they proposed. And then you can see that each person votes. They also have what's called personal influence points. The personal influence points gives, enhances your vote. And then different moments during the game just to unsettle things and also to make it realistic because the plague, once, once you, were, once you um, had the, the bubonic plague, you only had about three days to live generally it was quite painful to die so we had all different the game would change much more rapidly we had um some students played up to three to four different roles because you know they would be they'd be dead or in this case this was a barber a barber surgeon who was excommunicated so um it was really interesting as well because students went well above and beyond my expectations typically the speeches are done live in class. Instead, I had them do their speeches just to keep our time efficient. And then also when we, um, this is one I particularly like, um, uh, I liked them all because they all inhabited their roles. This is um, our mayor of Norwich. Um, and he also was the bailiff, a bailiff and the tavern keeper. Um, and it, after the first vote, there was a mix up. It was actually my fault. There was a mix up where he had voted twice. Some of the other players had caught that the mayor had, had voted twice. And here he is quite contrite. Um, and I love several of my students actually adopted um, dialects, some more effective than others, but we'll give you a- All right, there's much to be said and there's little time to say it. So I'll do my best to cover all the bases before we go to meet. So. First things first, I must apologize for what looked to be my indiscretion at our last meeting. I must swear on a stack of Bibles that I did not intend to vote twice. 
and I apologize for the record keeping error that made it look as though I did. I want you to know that I will do everything I can to earn your trust as mayor. Moving ahead from that, uh, I must give my thanks to the bishop for my indiscretion throwing the vote into question and the bishop's kindness in keeping the vote in our favor. This town must protect itself as best we can in the days to come. And the bishop has moved us in the right direction in doing so. Yeah, the bishop toward the end started to understand that the church had a lot more power than she re she understood. And so she was very, um, uh, she, the bishop and the other priests were very uh, looking for compromises. And then they realized that they didn't necessarily had to make those compromises in the Middle Ages. As well, um, two more things I'd like to show you is they had to write papers and I had done a little bit just a quick module about early modern and medieval broadsides which were um, uh, they would have been plastered um, on on the city walls it, it, um, done in manuscript at first and then after the printing press of course in in rudimentary print so I'd given them some examples, actually it was achronistic, uh, anachronistic, um, some examples of 16th century broadsides. The students had to write their papers and there were certain, uh, in their roll sheet, there were certain primary texts. All the students read all of the primary texts, but they had to um, specifically be engaging them as often as possible. This, I was very pleased. This was the very first one out of the gate. And so the uh, this is from a goldsmith, uh, Master Darby. Um, and if you just want to scan this. And so our gates must remain open to assist each and every guild. The doctors of Paris advanced in their skill, identify the plague at its source and assert that the cause is not ours. It is celestial, of course. These masters of medicine also assert that the plague is born of the soil and that packets of air, pockets of air seep out with control and cause our people to spoil. The student is specifically engaging humoral theory from the Middle Ages and then also um, looking at miasma theory. Again, you know, what happened since this was the first one out of the gate, then all of the rest of the students then um, um, wrote in verse, all of their broadsides in verse, and then they debated those and discussed them um, together. To wrap up, what I'll show you is each in Slack, each of the factions had their um, had their own discussion area where they could plot and scheme. And I found that this was really great. Um, in fact, it's going to change the way I do these games in person going forward because unlike um, in, in, in person, students have to sort of slip each other notes or give each other a wink or something like that. They can actually be in the in on Zoom either as a group or in small groups and be signaling to one another. So it was really fun as the game master and they had to speak to me. Yeah, good evening game master Tucker. Um, uh, they, they, they all spoke to me in character. Um, it, it, this was really great is to be on these Zoom calls and then my, my Slack was going bing, 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 bing all the time. Um, then there were other things. Red flower was um, each, each of, well, it turns out there were flagellants in the group in all of the factions. And so they had to be able, since it's a secret religious group, they had to be able to identify themselves. And so in the game material, students would uh, mention the word red flower as a way to find one another. And so I created, after they started to find each other, I would find, um, I, I created a new space for them to talk. And then we also had um, family tree because in the Middle Ages, it was considered that it, you know plague could come from bad air, it could come from the stars, it could come from God, it could also be the work of, of magic. And um, I didn't have enough roles, or the, and so I needed to supplement the game. So I began writing more roles of women. There weren't enough women in the game, in my opinion. And uh, so we found I found some uh, uh, herbalist women who were working in herbal herbal medicine. Um, who also did some um, abortions and also were uh, were dabbling in witchcraft, and we had a full-on witch trial um, toward the end. Um, and they uh, and they all had to at one point make a vote um, for which protective device they were going to be using. Protective would they be using? Would they 
would they make a donation to the church? Would they um, use a talisman or would they uh, give to the poor? Oh, yeah, I can't, no, it wasn't give to the poor. It was something in something to bring the uh, the trades faction in. I can't remember. So the game is really, you play it off the cuff. Um, it's very, uh, you play it off the cuff, but it's really well structured. And I didn't think that I'd be able to do this at all asynchronously. And it ended up working like a gem. And I'm glad that I get to do it again next spring, but I'm gonna move it out of Norwich because the game's still in development. So that gave me tons of freedom. I'm gonna move it out of Norwich and move it into an area that I'm more familiar with, which is um, the Black Death in 1665 London. And, and that, that way I can do a lot more about sort of city design and things like that. So anyway, I went a little bit long there, Derek, but I'm done. All right, thank you, Holly. Um, we did have a question in the chat, but I'm gonna save that until after all three of our panelists go. Um, and uh, I, I will say, though, having sat in on a couple of your um, reacting to the past simulations and the before times when we were in the same room, um, I was very excited to hear how you had adapted to uh, uh, the, the online environment. And, and I can see how some things are like the extra tool set has just kind of opened up the door for more options. Um, so that's very exciting. Shaul, I'll ask you to share next and, and tell us about uh, uh, the simulation that you used this fall. OK, fantastic. Um, let me just get the screen share going here. So I did a simulation um, in person that I've done before in previous classes, but um, because I was teaching in person and you know some of the students would end up in quarantine, um, figuring out how to adapt an in-person simulation for COVID protocols, and quarantining was the that was that was the main challenge I had um, with this. So I was teaching. Uh, I am teaching a class this semester. It's a it's a first year writing seminar um, entitled "The Cold War Struggle to Free Soviet Jews," and there we go. Um, there's a unit where we are looking at how activists in this global movement, but really we're looking at activists in the states. Um, how they engaged children and got kids involved in activism. So part of what they did was they, they created simulations that they played in, in summer camps and in Hebrew schools. And these things were pretty common. If you went to a Jewish summer camp in the 70s and 80s, there's a good chance that you would have played a game like this called Exodus, the Russian Jewry simulation game. And the point of the game was to play, that students by and large were playing the roles of Soviet Jews who wanted to emigrate from the country, but were forbidden to emigrate. And if they filed an official request to leave, then they would, they would get fired from their jobs. They might lose their apartments. They faced all different types of, of um, forms of government harassment. And the simulation is to essentially run the bureaucratic gauntlet, apply for the visa and get the run around there, get sent to the KGB, have to get a security clearance, but you don't have funds. So they'll send you to the bank. And each of these office, uh, each of the bureaucratic offices is, is obstructing and is sending the people running back and forth. So when I, um, when I teach this in a normal situation, it's a, it's a pretty small defined area and there's a lot of hustle and bustle and moving back and forth. So that clearly is not, is not um, an option in this type of a situation. Now, Usually what I will do is I'll have, some of the students will play the would-be immigrants and other students will play the hostile bureaucrats. I'll join in as a hostile bureaucrat um, and I'll take long tea breaks, chai breaks to make the students wait in line. Um, but here the question was how, if, if some of the students are present and some of the students are not, how do we, how do we balance that? Uh, I'll say that the goal for the students who are playing the would-be immigrants is to, is to get a visa. And the way that this simulation game is set up, maybe about 10% of the students will actually be able to, to succeed and, and, and get out, so to speak. Um, so my, my learning goals for this were both direct. I wanted students actually to learn about what were the challenges that Soviet Jews faced when they were trying to emigrate, but I had a meta goal and we were doing the simulation to think about and to learn about the simulation itself and to look at how the plight of Soviet Jews was taught to American Jewish youth. And so we did the simulation and then we reflected on how might kids who had participated in this 
learn and, and, and what does that mean? And it raises all types of interesting issues um, about using fun to study oppression and things that we don't think go together, but um, we, we looked at how this movement uh, brought the two together. Okay, so we spread the simulate, to actually do this, uh, we spread the simulation stations outside. We used the dining tents to maintain physical distancing. It was something that it was really, it would not have been possible to do um, inside. And fortunately, we had, a, we had a physical plant that actually made this, that made this possible. And you can see um, the, you'll, you'll see here are students at a station. Um, here is a station. Uh, there's a station somewhere over here and there's some back there and we'll zoom in a little bit and I'll show you what's going on. So in some instances, we had the station workers who were present in person. Um, and they, the station workers stayed in place. This was the banker. And these, these would-be emigrants were trying to get funds that they would need to pay for the emigration visa. Um, other station workers were not present. And so here you'll see, this is a student who's at the KGB office and you can't see the face, but the KGB officer is a student who is in quarantine here. This is another student waiting in line to go next. Um, and that required planning pretty much day before and morning of because it wasn't clear to me if the students are gonna be coming back or not. And I didn't know exactly who was gonna be in and who would be out. So uh, it, it's a first year writing seminar. There are 15 students. It was easy to maintain the communication to find out who would actually be physically present, who was gonna be coming in remotely. And what I did is I allocated the roles based on whether people would be in person or not. The immigrants have to move from station to station and the stations are fixed in place. And so I decided that anyone who is remote is going to be a station worker. And I assigned those roles in advance and gave them all the preparation materials that they had. And so all the, the conversation was carried out um, through, the, uh, through laptops, through iPads and the like. Fortunately, I was able myself to scrounge together enough laptops and iPads that um, for, for the number of students who were remote. But if there were more students who were coming in remotely, then I would have had a tech shortage and might have needed to call on the students to help with their own laptops or, or something like that. Um, but there were tech considerations um, that, I, that, that we had to think about. And here you'll see this student uh, who is on the screen is playing uh, someone from the Soviet Jewish community who's trying to actually help the immigrants to navigate the bureaucracy. There, this is a, it's a formal simulation curriculum published 1974. Um, and it had a lot of forms to fill out and a lot of paperwork. And one of the things that we could not do was exchange paper. So if at the bank, you know, instead they, normally they would give this in Stalin, we trust trusty Stalin banknote, and then they would walk it over to the visa office and pay. We couldn't do that anymore. So what I had, so what I had students do to adapt for that was they the students who had to fill out forms would fill out their own forms, um, but there would be no exchange. Any exchange would be done through photograph, showing photographs on the on the screen, and if there was anything, if they needed to get a form signed, for example, and then take that signed form to another office, they would take a picture of, they would take a selfie with themselves and the station worker giving a thumbs up and that would count. Um, and so that's how we did that. But it required some thinking in advance of all the ways in which the simulation as originally structured would not be protocol compliant. And then thinking about ways to adapt um, for that. So I'll wrap up on that, but I just want to say that we did a number of other games and simulations in the class, and I'll just quickly go through these, although I'm not going to um, detail too much. Um, we used some of the COVID protocols to our advantage. So it was really common in, this, in, in the movement to free Soviet Jews, which is going on from the 60s to the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s, um, as a way of symbolizing the absence of, of Jews who were not being allowed to leave, synagogues around the world would reserve an empty seat on the pulpit. Sometimes they would mark the seat with the name of a refusenik who they had adopted. Um, and 
when we were learning about how, still, still in, the, in, the set, in the unit on mobilizing youth, when we were looking at how activists engaged bar and bat mitzvah, boys and girls, by matching them up with Soviet Jewish twins. Um, and so it would be, for example, I'm 13, year old, 13 years old, I'm, I'm uh, rising to the pulpit to, to recite my prayers for my bar mitzvah, and it's not only me, Shaul Kellner, who's coming up here. I'm gonna I'm gonna say these prayers on behalf of my Soviet twin, Leonid Baras. And let me tell you about Leonid and his family. His father's a journalist. He was fired from his work for writing things that the government didn't like. Then they lost their apartment. They're trying to emigrate. Da, 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 da. Leonid cannot have a bar mitzvah um, because he's not allowed to in in the Soviet Union. Um, so there were lists and lists of all these Soviet Jewish quote unquote twins that were given out to 12 and 13 year olds across the US, thousands of them in the 1980s. The 15 students each got bar and bat mitzvah twins. They learned a bit about the twin. They delivered their bar and bat mitzvah speech, including thanking the rabbi and saying, and to my little brother, um, even though you annoy me, I still love you. You know, they were, they were, they were, they were authentic. But one of the things that we also did is we used the, the um, distancing protocols to bring the absent twins present, to make them present. And that was something the movement did a lot of, making the absent present. Um, and so you can see you can see one name here, but if you look back, you'll see others. Anywhere that the students were sitting on the, um, on the, on the banner next to them that were using for the, keeping the seats apart for social distancing, um, they flipped them over. I gave them erasable markers and they wrote the name of their twin. And so the twins are physically present in the room with us to evoke the empty chairs that, that you would see in the in the synagogues. Um, we also did simulations and games that were entirely online. And again, a lot of this was reprising things that were done by activists in the movement. 1980, Moscow Olympics, um, activists in Britain had a poster contest for school kids across Europe competing for freedom. And the students did this, at, they did this at home, posted on Brightspace. And then we took it, and then we voted, and you can see our bronze, silver, and gold medalists. Okay, takeaways. First, yes, we can. I'm thinking specifically about the in-person nature of this. Um, the assumption that doing active learning in a socially distanced classroom is impossible, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and we shouldn't assume it. We can do a lot more than, the, than we think we can if we give ourselves permission to try. Um, among the things that, that came up as I was trying to plan the, the um, immigration simulation were issues around the need for technology, um, how we manage mobility in, in a simulation that requires people to move around, um, how we, what, what type of space we can use, and how we allocate roles when not everyone is going to be physically present, but how can we allocate roles in a way so that everyone can participate in a meaningful way. Um, university infrastructure was crucial for this. If we did not have those tents, I don't know how I would have done this. And so the outdoor learning space really made the, the immigration simulation possible. Um, and also it really is even, it's possible, but it's inherently precarious. Um, the outdoor learning is vulnerable to weather. We did this on a beautiful day at the beginning of October. Um, had this been a rainy January day, it would have been a different thing. I, I hear that we're getting heated tents which is fantastic. We're going to need the heat in the tents if we want to do stuff outside. Um, and I, I think that even, you know, even January, February, February um, when the weather gets cold, we will still be able to do this type of stuff. We just need to really be creative and, 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 use, the, and use the systems that we now have in place that are keeping us, that are making it possible for us to be in person and safe at the same time. So I'll, I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Shaul. And again, I'm impressed at the creativity you brought to uh, adapting the simulation to the, the current situation. Um, and just the thoughtful connections outside of the one simulation, the thoughtful connections that you drew between, um, you know, making the absent present um, and how, um, how that played out for the experience of Soviet Jews, but also kind of how we're, we're having to navigate that right now as well. Um, that's it's just it's just really impressive. Um, Kate, 
Uh, you're next. Uh, Kate's, uh, Kate's experience is a little bit different. It wasn't uh, tied to a particular course, um, but she was doing some really interesting things with simulations this year as well. Kate, would you mind sharing? Yeah. Thank you uh, very much for having me. Um, I've loved hearing these other examples of, of making all of this uh, work in this really um, seemingly impossible situation, but making it work. Uh, and so my story of the simulation or game that I use actually starts at Learning at Play last year. Um, when we were at Learning at Play last year, um, I would say maybe like 50% of the presentations mentioned this thing called Twine. And so I left that session and I spent probably a whole week just trying to figure out how to use Twine and being really overwhelmed because I wanted to do like a really big Thing. I wanted to like write some sort of interactive textbook online or something. I was like, this is cool. I will do it. Um, and I overwhelmed myself. And so I just sort of dropped it. But Twine, I will share my screen, um, is this um, online open source way that you can um, make like non-linear games sort of like choose your own adventure activities. Um, and so I just sort of uh, went online and I tried it. And as I mentioned, I got really overwhelmed. Um, and so I dropped it and then I got tapped to teach this, the STEM specialization for the Center for Teaching over the summer. And at, on Monday in our first session, a participant mentioned that, um, they assume that we could probably use video games in the classroom, but they don't know how. And I was supposed to teach video games, uh, sorry, I was supposed to um, teach uh, using technology later on in the week. It was only a one week course. And so Monday I decided I'm gonna figure out how to make a twine and make it and, sh and share it with them later on this week. And so I think part of that shows you how easy twine actually is that I could just sort of like pick it up and try it. And so um, I didn't really know what I could quickly put together to show this um, group of grad students and postdocs how to use twine. Um, but earlier, this was this, this, the second week in June. And so we'd been in the pandemic for a while. We were trying to figure out what was going to happen in the fall. And um, there had been these think pieces online about what COVID might look like in the fall if we have to do all these social distanced activities. Um, how would we have students in the classroom and have them actually be able to learn? Um, and they were all coming from this very typical student perspective, that there was no perspective from students who have disabilities or chronic illnesses, or that there were no perspectives that were taking into account the fact that we're going through a racial upheaval, like a reckoning in the, the US. Um, and um, at that point in time, there had just been some governmental um, um, legislation that would make it harder for trans individuals to get health care in the US. And so again, there were a lot of these think pieces about what the experience was going to be like for students if, if, if things were on campus, but thinking only about sort of the typical student. And so I thought, okay, why don't I try to use a storytelling, like a narrative empathy building way to really evoke the terror that a lot of students are going to feel if they have to go back to campus in the fall. And so um, I can just sort of sh sh show you um, quickly, this is what the, the, the game or the story looks like. I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, I can sh show you how easy it is to just make things in Twine, you just like, add a passage and then you write things and then you uh, link it to other things. And then I can quickly sh uh, show you how there is so much on the internet to figure out how to use Twine. And so it's really a really simple uh, way to make these sort of choose your own adventure games. Um, and so, so this is kind of meta that the purpose of this wasn't really 
to evoke any feelings. The original purpose was to teach how to use Twine. Um, but then I ended up getting over 140,000 clicks onto this, um, which was just sort of unbelievable and not really expected. And I think that that shows how telling these stories, uh, how using uh, these and, and the narratives can help people get in the uh, a mindset or in the sh shoes of an individual's um, experience. Um, and there are cool ways that you can um, code the game so that, so the story um, is about a black trans disabled individual on campus um, in the fall. Um, and you sort of get the experience of what it's like to try to avoid COVID. Um, and I can actually program into that how likely it is that you will get COVID based on the choices th that you make, um, which is like a nice piece of, a nice way to be able to teach students how to program. You can use Twine to teach programming, but you can also use Twine to teach storytelling and you can also use Twine to teach empathy. And so I think all of these reasons, um, I. I I guess this really has just become a commercial for Twine, which is not what I meant to do, but I think it's awesome um, as a tool to use. And so I will drop the link in the chat. Um, and if you all want to play through it, it takes about four minutes. And so I will hand it back over to Derek. All right. Thank you, Kate. Um, and just for completion, you actually made a few different Twine stories, correct? Yes, the first one is from a um, the perspective of an undergrad student, and there's one from the perspective of faculty, one from the perspective of staff, and one from the perspective of grad students trying to sort of demonstrate that um, the way that you, given your role, are anticipating that you will experience COVID is not necessarily the way that everyone is experiencing mm -hmm. COVID. Um, and I was hopeful that it might have caused more changes than it did. And maybe that was really naive and hopeful of me, but. Well, and and so, and when did you release these Twine stories? It was over the summer, right? Yes, I released the first one on June 15th. Okay. So you were, um, I'm gonna take the first question here. You, you, were, you were kind of making some predictions about what life might be like on campus for different types of individuals this fall. Um, now that we're in November, do you, do you think that your stories captured some important elements of those experiences as, as they played out? So I'm not sure, and I will tell you a little bit about my positionality. Um, part of that story was my own, right? I have actually not been on campus since March 9th, I think it was. Um, I have not left my house more than a dozen times since March. Um, and so I actually have no idea what it's like out there in the real world right now, because I can't leave. And so I think you all would actually be better uh, assessors of how it actually has captured what's going on. But I do think it has accurately captured um, the, the feelings of a lot of people that a lot of uh, people uh, uh, reached out um, telling me how scared they were. Um, I also had quite a few parents reach out telling me how um, uh, parents of college students telling me how they hadn't even thought about what it would be like for anybody else. They knew that their um, undergrad student was struggling being alone. So they just wanted to put their undergrad student on campus, but that they actually kind of had their uh, their mind open by the idea that going to campus is not the best option for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. And I do think, um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know if your Twine stories changed policy, but I do, I do think it, it they created a lot more empathy and kind of open-mindedness to, to different types of experiences that individuals have. Um, if you have other questions for our panelists, go ahead and, and put them in the chat and I'll do my best to kind of pitch them to the, to the panelists. Um, I'm gonna start with one from Elizabeth. Um, and actually Elizabeth, would you mind turning your, your mic on and sharing your question about the kind of ethical considerations that you wondered? 
Yeah, sure. So I'm better at writing than I am at speaking. But my question was essentially, you know, as somebody who studies human rights violations and is really interested in, you know, anti-racist and justice oriented education, I'm curious as to how when using games in the classroom or in any other teaching environment for the panelists, what ethical considerations have you made and balancing the idea of creating this new way or, you know, using this way that's very interactive and engaging, but also not trivializing experiences that are traumatic. Um, I'm thinking of what is his name? The, um, the Unsilence Project, Dr. Danny Cohen, and he's created a bunch of simulations and games having to do with the Holocaust and other, you know, traumatic histories. And he calls them serious games and has certain limitations, like he will never include, you know, have it be from the perspective of a victim or of a perpetrator. And he's very careful in how he does that. And that made me think, oh, games don't have to be trivializing. So I'm, I'm really curious about what ethical considerations you all have made or what challenges you might have bumped into. You know, I'll take, I'll take it from my side. Um, I, I, you know, I've taught the history of pandemics before and uh, I've never gamified it, but I find that students keep sort of this arm's length you know, approach to their experience or to their understanding of the human experience. And I was concerned about that is, um, you know, will it allow them to, to uh, get deeper into the human dimensions of experiencing plague? Um, or will it just be sort of a trivial experience? I think given the, given the circumstances right now, I think that students treat it with a, a, a lot more nuance. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I also think that it was really helpful. I also worried, you know, okay, I'm doing the Grim Reaper lottery. Um, we don't know where this is going. Um, is this going to hit a little bit too close to home for students? Mm -hmm. If anything, what I found for the students is that they were already primed to sort of want to understand their characters better. At the same time, I think it was a relief to them to be in a pandemic setting um, in the game and be able to um, be another person, right? Mm -hmm. Is we're all experiencing the pandemic as our own person is, is to at least now ha um, have a chance to get an arm's length. It's, it's a weird sort of flip, if that makes any sense of what it was before where they were arm's length and that wasn't a great thing. Um, and the game allows them to be slightly arm's length away from their own pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. And it was this relief. And I, you know, there were silly times. Like I would, I had, um, oh, what is it from the Harry Potter game? The uh, the ones, the scary guys who suck the breath out of you or whatever. The mentors. The men, yeah, right. And so anytime, I, so I was using that that theme song when they would come in to announce the Grim Reaper lottery. Of course, that evokes a whole bunch of laughter on the students. And so to be able to take the seriousness of our mm -hmm. moment and the seriousness of a past moment and still be able to laugh around it was really a remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. But there were definitely eth ethical uh, layers to that that I needed to think through before I was ready to, to decide I was gonna do the game. Uh, the laughter remi reminded me, I don't know if you can see this. This is a book that was published during <laughs> the Soviet Dream Movement by activists raising awareness called The Jokes of Oppression, <clears throat> Humor of Soviet Jews. So humor was it was a part of the movement. Humor is a resource that people who were who were facing oppression were using in their own defense as a way of of of, of getting of getting through this. Um, you know, it's, I, I, for me because I'm not just doing the simulation. We're also going meta on it. So I feel like these are these are college students, and we're able to by asking the question, Elizabeth, that you're asking. That's another level of learning that I think is is valuable. So, um, you know, like that, that's one of the things that, that we that we engaged in conversation. You know, what does it mean to teach this in this way? What does it mean when when some of the camp counselors were playing the KGB as cartoon villains, for example? And so and we and we and we and we processed that. There's also in the chat, Dylan uh, Kistler wrote something that's, uh, that, that's I, I thought was a um, mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, I thought that comment was really helpful. And especially Shaul was my dissertation advisor and, you know, 
we talked a lot about tourism and how tourism isn't necessarily this trivial thing and that it can be really meaningful to people. And I really liked Dylan's comment about games, you know, that they're not inherently trivializing a given topic. Yeah. Dylan, would you like to say a little more about that? Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, as someone who loves to study games, I like to do this really wishful thinking that one day there won't be a genre called um, serious games, right? Because um, people just inherently know that there can be a serious and comedic, a playful and not playful element. And there are games out there which really are not very playful and fun. Um, they're few and far between, but I think there's a lot of space for those games. But I think just like many novels on very serious topics can have irony and satire, so too a game can be playful and still treat serious topics really well. So if anything, it's more like um, the population in our culture is very illiterate at how to play games thoughtfully. We're all pretty literate at how to read literature thoughtfully. Um, we can read something that's very comedic and still take thoughtfulness out of it. But most of us are pretty illiterate with playing games thoughtfully. And so not a lot of um, citizens in our country, I think, can approach a game playfully and still take something thoughtfully from it. But I think that's less a failing of the medium and more a failing of how we've learned how to play. We, we don't really teach people how to play thoughtfully in our culture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also reminded um, a few years ago, uh, we had on campus uh, Nick Susanis, who um, got some renown for completing his dissertation in comic book form. Um, he was making an argument about kind of visual literacy and visual education. And the best way for him to make that argument was to use a visual medium. Um, I think he was the first dissertation as graphic novel. Um, but I can imagine a, a Twine story or, or some type of interactive game um, as a, you know, as a scholarly object, um, um, that, 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 that seems very interesting to me. Kate, I'm wondering, do you have thoughts on the kind of the ethics of using something that, you know, can be playful to, to, uh, to delve into some pretty serious subjects? Yeah, well, so I thought a lot about this and, and I worried a lot about trying to, I, I mean, if you play the stories, just bad things continue to happen to you, right? And it really doesn't matter what choices you make, the bad things just keep coming. Um, and that felt really heavy. Um, and, and, and I think part of what is useful about a game is that you do get to step out of it when it gets too heavy. If you feel kind of overwhelmed by it, you do get to just leave. Um, and so I think that it provides a good medium for learning about um, struggles that other people have or oppression that has happened historically mm -hmm. because you can sort of do it at your own pace, uh, which I mean, unless you are a member of that marginalized or oppressed group and you don't get to just step out of it, you just step yeah. back into the world. Um, but, but, but I think having that ability to step away might allow people to engage with with these concepts uh, more uh, willingly and more readily. Um, but I think that there is also the, the challenge of not tr trivializing it, especially like I don't, um, I am not a part of all of the marginalized groups who I have um, written from the perspective of in, in the stories. And so, so I think it's, a very fine line to walk where it's not sort of like taking that on when it's not your thing to take on and speak from. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm reminded of Holly's comments about the arm's length distance, right? So so having a game, um, the player has a little more control over kind of how they engage. And so that level of autonomy can help them actually engage more um, by being able to kind of dial it in or out as they feel comfortable, um, you know. Yeah. Holly, there was another question in the chat about the Reacting to the Past Consortium. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit more about how people might find or use games from that consortium? Sure. Um, you can go to the Reacting to the Past website, see the games. Now, there are published games and there are games in the development. Uh, the games in development are harder to, to get a hold of. In fact, I didn't know that I was going to be playing this game. I'd hoped to, but I could not get the game itself. Um, so I uh, lurked around and went in and um, they have, a, I think every month they have a reacting to the past coffee hour on, um, on Zoom. You can find out about it in the, in the reacting to the past faculty lounge. 
um, which is a uh, which is a page on Facebook. So you can, I would recommend if you're interested in reacting to the past is to start there. I don't like being on Facebook, um, but that's, that's a great place to begin. Sure. Um, and so I was able to get the game um, because I was in a breakout session and people were like, well, what game are you playing this semester? And I said, well, I'm hoping to play Norwich 1349. Has anybody played that? And the woman in the room said, I wrote it. <laughs> and so she gave me the game materials and then basically worked with me on it. Um, it they it is free to use. Um, the students need to purchase for the published games, they need to purchase the textbook. I find the textbooks to be very reasonable. Um, and then online, you can get, uh, you have to apply and indicate that you're uh, an instructor. And then you can get the, uh, the the game master book in the instructional materials. What I will say is if you decide to do a game, feel free to contact me because at first it can be very overwhelming. Um, even if you know the topic quite well, it can be extremely overwhelming sort of knowing what the moving parts are. Um, but I've come to learn is what you do is you just throw yourself into the abyss and you trust the game design. The game designers are they, they've been vetted, they sort of have a sense of where the game's going to go and you just trust it. Um, but I think it'd be lovely if others were interested. There's such a rich diversity of games out there for reacting to the past if, if we had our own Vanderbilt consortium. Um, in fact, at the Robert M. Warren Center, we've been thinking really about trying to, um, to enhance that and to do more courses around gaming in the humanities. I love that. Um, I do want, we've just got a couple of minutes left and I'm gonna ask a very center for teaching question. Um, how, do you, how do you help your students um, reflect on or synthesize what they've learned through these types of games and simulations? We were doing class discussion um, in yep. the session following. And reacting to the past has a, um, post-mortem, in this case, it was pretty appropriate, a, a post-mortem post session um, where uh, you debrief with the students, what did you learn? Um, what were your thoughts? Um, how did you nuance them? I also had students write a, an, a after each vote, if they had to tell me, um, did you meet your objectives? What are some things that happened that I might not know about? And it's so interesting because there are things that happen behind the scenes that you have no idea that somebody's doing this or, you know, dirty dealing another person. And they did a very similar thing at the end where they reflected on their own their own interactions um, and then the underlying significance of the game. I think debriefing is very important. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't actually teach this um, like, like for the content, but I can tell you that um, it popped up on a bunch of um, forums on the internet. <laughs> uh, and I could sort of watch people have conversations about it in real time where they, they criticized it that there weren't enough options. And then a person would respond, like that's the point. The point is that there are no options. Um, and somebody wrote, um, the only way to win this game is not to play. And I was like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> like you figured it out, you got it. Um, and so I, I, I think maybe in making stories like this, opening it up for feedback or criticism, cause I, that's what the internet and forums are, right? It's just mm -hmm. a place for criticism um, maybe would help them to sort of like walk through what the point of it was and why the game was designed or structured in the way that it was. You know, Kate, I was struck. Um, I remember when you, when you were, you know, you'd released it thinking, wow, she's got this clarity on where we are right now um, and where we are still, but we certainly most certainly in June, we were all like swimming around and having no idea where we were going. And um, and then Shaul, you know, the uncertainty of doing this game, um, you know, in a tent and modifying it. And then certainly, you know, playing my own game, the uncertainty, you don't know where this is going to lead. Each game looks different. I've played, you know, the French Revolution where Louis the 14th 
I'm sorry, Louis the 16th survives and the monarchy continues. And I've had other ones where he doesn't. And so I think with gaming and teaching, you really have to more than even mm -hmm. ever, you have to really give yourself into the uncertainty of the process, right? And that sort of makes it fun and scary at the same time. Well, I think we'll leave it there. That's actually a good note to, to end on. Um, when we start to take experiments and be a little creative uh, with our students, yes, uh, we have unpredictable outcomes, which is a little scary, but also where some of the, the really great stuff happens. So um, let's give our panelists a round of virtual applause for um, sharing their work here today. Um, thank you so much for participating. Um, I did mention in the chat that we've recorded this session, um, and so I'll make the link available to you all. Um, I know there were some folks who couldn't make it here today, so we'll, we'll share this as we can. Um, and if you'd like to chat more about uh, learning at play, teaching with games and simulations, feel free to reach out to me. I'll see if we can maybe organize some type of event for the spring as well on this theme. So thanks again for being here today. It was good to see you all.